Uh, hello everyone, I'm going to be reacting to Nostalgia Critic's review of Spider-Man No Way Home. I mean, what can I say that nobody else has said about this, that anybody else has said about this movie? I love this movie. Like, it just, like, you know, I guess it's the nostalgia of bringing back all the villains I loved growing up, watching Doc Ock, Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin again, uh, you know, uh, just, and, uh, you know, uh, seeing the Sandman and, uh, of course, and of course seeing freaking Tobey Maguire come back as Spider-Man, like, like, and oh my God, like that part where Tobey got stabbed, like, oh my God, it like scared me to death. I was like, oh my God, like scared, like, oh my God, are they really going to do this? Like kill the original Spider-Man for a sec? I was like. Oh my god, like please, for the love of God, don't. But other than that, I love the movie. It was awesome. So let's see what Doug has to say about it. universe gun from the wardrobe room sounds right i figure since we're reviewing no way home it'd be cool to see what we look like in a parallel universe but isn't that a sheet that says don't do that though critic put that there oh by all means light it up hey malcolm hey Tamara. what in god's name are you doing we found your portal gun yeah we figured we could find different versions of ourselves for the spider-man review <laughs> now now you don't need to do that in fact i'll do that hey why are you so concerned with us using this You're a spider critic! Malcolm Morales? Temptavious! This is awesome! Why did you not want us to see this? Hey, it's the copycat! What? Let me guess, he reviews nostalgic properties with over-the-top reactions? <gasps> that is absurd. Yes. Yes. And he's been wearing a similar outfit for 18 years? No, 15. <gasps> Did you steal from the Spider-Verse? No. It's the exact same thing, except yours is more successful. No, it's a different universe, so it doesn't count. Why? Fewer people have seen it. Hey, come on, this guy doesn't even sound like me. I am appalled that someone would be stealing from us so blatantly. He sounds just like Gilbert Gottfried. So? You sound just like Gilbert Gottfried. I can't even do Gilbert Gottfried. Watch. <clears throat> A guy walked into a talent agent! God damn, he won't try not to, I do. He took the same idea we had, recreated it, and everyone thinks it's so fresh and new. Okay, okay, so I surrounded myself with similar people and similar ideas, but... I'm scratching my back, okay? Jesus Christ. Artistically, people like you more? Suck oh, my oh, mind! Oh, Are you kidding me? Oh, I can't good. believe you're going! Look, the guy pointing! I think it's clear we're not gonna look because it's an obviously fabricated distraction. And he escaped while I was explaining that! Split up and find him! Can we wave our fists and yell? Yes, preferably. Should successful property be praised when something like it was already done? In the same franchise? Don't get me wrong, it happens whether we agree to it or not. Hunger Games with Battle Royale, X-Men with Doom Patrol, Fam of the Opera with School Days, it's an age-old occurrence. Though with one of the biggest movies to come out in recent years, Spider-Man No Way Home, I was shocked how few people were pointing out the similarities between a Spider-Man property many still proclaim as the best Spider-Man movie into the Spider-Verse. Praised by critics and audiences, and even winning the Oscar for Best Animated Film, it didn't get the box office return it was hoping for, or at least nothing near No Way Home. Sony is doubling down though, literally, with two sequels in the works, hoping the goodwill it's built up will equal good ticket sales. But that still raises the question, is a Sony movie about Spider-Man in a multiverse of crossovers ripping off another Sony movie about Spider-Man in a multiverse of crossovers? 
Hey, so who plays Daredevil in your universe? Affleck! It's complicated. First of all, you have to realize the hype around this movie was almost next level. I'm really not kidding when I say this was on par with Endgame or The Dark Knight. It wasn't just past characters from Spider-Man meeting up, it was past actors. The internet flipped. Just seeing Alfred Molina and knowing there could be even more actors involved made everyone, well... Honestly, the movie still would have done great even if it was just okay. But luckily it had some great action, wonderful acting, and surprisingly brilliant storytelling that balanced a ton of characters, many of them beloved, into one movie without being a huge mess. Only one other Spider-Man film managed to do this more effectively, and you guessed it, it came out four years earlier. But here's the thing, not only is No Way Home live action, which doesn't make it a better experience, but does make it a different experience, but it's done at the height of the nostalgic reboot. Yes, nostalgic properties have been milked for years, but the idea of getting the original cast decades later for a reunion slash reimagining is not only hot, but it's fading into lukewarm. No Way Home came out just as people were starting to get sick of aging stars banking on your fond memories. But it still did something new yet familiar, winning everybody over. And that's no small feat. I don't think it's an example of Spider-Verse walk so No Way Home could run. It's more Spider-Verse run so No Way Home could run in a different way. While there are similarities, and I still stand by Spider-Verse as the better film, I think it's important to understand why this worked as well as it did, and why, in my opinion, it's a case of influence, not ripoff. To a point where people you think would call it a ripoff don't. Aha! He's in here! Damn it! What? What's wrong? We come from a universe where the aliens from science took over. We're not very good with doors! It's okay, let's just get some water and think of a plan. Ah! Let's take a look at Spider-Man No Way Home. Yes. The film picks up right where the last one left off with Spider-Man, played by Tom Holland, being outed as Peter Parker and his girlfriend, MJ, played by Zendaya, caught in the middle after people think he killed the false hero, Mysterio. Even though the effects in this are hit and miss, I have to admit the swinging scenes are probably the best since Amazing Spider-Man 2. Yes, good things came out of that aside from Giamatti's accent. I just so I kill you! I destroy you! They go to Aunt May, played again by Marissa Tomei, but so do the police and everybody gets arrested. I hate it when the jackass cop in the movie has a point. A boy was entrusted to you and as his legal guardian, you not only allowed him to endanger himself, but you actually encouraged it. Uh, my client would like to refer to the argument of, oh come on, comic books! They're released on bail and greeted by, I don't care what anyone says, my favorite cameo. That's great. <laughs> Oh, does your universe not require an audience track with your movie? No. Ours does. It's the law. It's the law for all your movies to have audience tracks? No, just this one. Yeah, the pauses go on way too long without them. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Oh, this track's especially good because I was at the screening. <laughs> I really like this cameo for two reasons. One, it's nice knowing these series are still canon. Two, Peter doesn't have any money, so it makes sense he would represent it. Which is more than I can say for that Jennifer Susan Waters. God, I hate her ads. Peter, MJ, and his pal Ned all try their best to adapt, and I knew this movie was working when I realized I didn't need the characters from the other movies. No part of me was getting restless or looking at my phone saying, when are they going to arrive? These leads are so ridiculously likable, their problems surprisingly relatable, and the pacing for as much information as they throw at you is amazingly stellar. Much like Spider-Verse, this should not work, but it brilliantly balances out. In light of recent controversy, we are unable to consider your application at this time. Peter sees his friends are not accepted into college, most likely because of him. So he goes to his friend Dr. Strange, played by Benedict Cumberbatch's still hilarious American accent. Sanctum's built at the intersection of cosmic energy currents. Some of these walls are thousands of years old. This is Constable Wickham's. Remove your knickers and wait in the bus. Who can possibly help out while defrosting his house? Yeah, I still don't know what the point of that was. The entire world's about to forget that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Yeah, how good is this movie? It takes a story as terrible as One More Day and says, I can fix it! So my girlfriend's just gonna forget about everything we've been through? I think it's 
cool. Peter is messing with things he shouldn't mess with, but not for selfish reasons. Everything he does in this movie, for the most part, is to help others. He's fine taking shit, but he doesn't want to ruin his friends' futures. Even his major goal is to rehabilitate people, not just to beat them up. You could have just left us to die. Why didn't you? Because that's not who he is. He's essentially a live-action Eek the Cat. He says it never hurts to help, then spends a lifetime getting hurt. Harold Happy Hogan, he used to work with Tony Stark for the When he interrupts the spell, things go wrong, but strange things, he can contain it. You know, after everything we've been through together, somehow I always forget, you're just a kid. A 26-year-old kid. He's watching GQ's Men of the Year! Peter tries to convince the Vice Chancellor of a college to let his friends in, but he's attacked by a familiar face. <laughs> The law. Like I was saying, we get Doc Ock back in the picture, played again by Alfred Molina. Hello, Peter. You might be wondering why I'm 20 years older and 50 pounds lighter. The answer is, ooh, the Doc Ock theme. Da, 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 classic. I should point out almost every action scene is ridiculously creative. I mean, this is an eight-legged octopus man fighting an eight-legged Spider-Man. Can we just give thanks we live in a world where this is popular? Pairing new device. Peter uses the nanotechnology from his suit to control Doc Ock's arms, but more importantly, his friends are getting into college! Again, this movie is really working when I was concerned about that throughout the entire fight. I'm gonna talk to admissions about your friends, and I'm gonna talk to them about you. I'm gonna get you that role in the Uncharted movie. Oh, please don't. Strange finds out Octavius isn't the only new arrival, though, as he locks up both him and the lizard. Frankly, the multiverse is a concept about which we know frighteningly little. I saw everything everywhere at once, and I couldn't follow a lick of it. This looks like a job for half the characters from Recess. Scooby-Doo this shit! You know, I know a couple of magic words myself, starting with the word please. <laughs> yeah, to be honest, I hated that. Oh my god, like, she's actually gonna talk like, oh, it's your fault that all this happened, when really, it was your boyfriend's fault. He let his identity out. He told a complete stranger who he is, his real name. It's, it's your boyfriend's fault, girl. Like, Jesus Christ. Like, if there's anyone you should be going after, it's him, not Doctor Strange. Like, what the f- What? Not cool. They try to figure out where other villains from other worlds could be, leading to a joke either love or hate. I'm sorry, what was your name again? Dr. Otto Octavius. <laughs> I hate it. Wait, no, seriously, what's your actual name? Now, the one that doesn't bother me too much because they made fun of it in the original. A guy named Otto Octavius winds up with eight limbs. What are the odds? And even Peter makes a joke about Strange's name. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made-up names. Um, I'm Spider-Man, then. So my only gripe is, wouldn't he be used to these names by now? Maybe an eye roll or something could work, but laughing this hard like this isn't the world you live in is a little strange. Doctor Strange. That's pretty good. See, even that worked a little better. They search through the internet, and I think onward cameos to discover two other visitors, Sandman and Electro. <laughs> Charles I absolutely love that Sandman helps out in this one, and despite both Thomas Hayden Church and Reese Evans barely showing their faces, it does make a difference having their incredibly distinct voices. Knowing how crazy the planning and scheduling for this must have been, it doesn't feel like a cheat. The power is different. Electro, played again by Jamie Foxx, you can tell they're trying to fix as a character compared to the last one, but all they get is he's a literal power-hungry villain who wants electricity. And given this, his writing's still consistently awkward. It's actually my fault that you're here. Like the universe? Or the woods? I hate the woods. It's barky and rough and irritating and it's everywhere! Strange traps them as well, and remember when I said the effects were hit and miss? The lizard is the worst of that. Speaking of which, what happened to you? Last I recall, you had bad teeth, glasses, and a comb over. He wasn't that great in effect to begin with, but now he looks like a Super Mario Brothers movie goon, but she's sandwiched with the Geico Gecko. We have a new world to conquer. Speaking of green abominations, when Willem Dafoe shows up. <laughs> Like, Willem Dafoe is the most underrated actor, man. Like, like he is just, like, so awesome. 
he was great in all the Raimi Spider-Man movies. He was, he he. Even though the movies are called Spider-Man, like he clearly stole the show every time he appeared on screen. It's it's just awesome. Here's my other personal biggest applaud moment. You can't escape yourself. You know how much I hated this mask. Defoe was a lot of fun in the first Spider-Man, but the idea of covering up this face for a character called Green Goblin is absolutely baffling to me. You could have given him some makeup or alter him in a way where people wouldn't recognize him, but you needed to see this face. Well, they finally listened to the Weird Al song and they gave him clothes that not only looked closer to the Goblin, but also allowed his face to match too. Aside from one cool scene where you see a mouth within a mouth, this movie showed how much of his performance we've been missing with his face covered up. My only complaint is I could have used it turning green a little bit. That's the one thing Amazing Spider-Man 2 started to play with that wasn't a bad idea. They just botched it up. He looked like the Rat King. I'm actually curious if they had that idea as Aunt May sticks him with something that doesn't have an effect, so I'm almost wondering why it was even in there. Maybe it was to give him that effect and they backed out at the last minute, I'm not sure. With that said, he's still perfectly over the top and clearly having a ball. But he's also legit kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> you Especially are right the there. one that Jesus. killed her. That's some neat trick. Peter, Peter, Peter. I also give oh, credit, God, he's not trying too. to fool Peter either. He goes to Aunt May and legit wants help. It's only later that the goblin takes over again. This makes the character so much more interesting and Peter's need to help him all the more relatable. Thanks, Frank. Hope to see you again. I ship it. He kills her later, but that means nothing in comics. caged up, Strange says he has to send them back to die. Peter thinks they're still good in them though and steals the spell from Strange who literally knocks him out of his body. What? How are you doing that? <laughs> Neat. Oh, that raises a good question. How is he doing that? The theory is it's his spider sense taking over? That's a bit of a stretch, but I guess I'd buy it. Either way, it doesn't matter though because the film never tells us. No, no, it's a spider thing. You remove its soul and it still has good reflexes. Watch, we'll show you with this spider here. Here we go. Oh, maybe not. Mm. Sorry, buddy. We're still here, by the way. And for no extra charge, we're given a really awesome Doctor Strange battle. We can't just send them home to die. It's their fate. The scene made me realize Strange wasn't just a throwaway cameo like in Thor Ragnarok where he just transports a character. He easily could have been written out. There's different ideologies being fought for here with Strange not wanting to mess with fate anymore and Peter wanting to do the right thing. And it does end up changing them. Don't believe me? This is Strange the first time he's going to erase Spider-Man. Nice knowing you, Spider-Man. This is him doing the same thing, but after Peter challenges the way he perceives things. Everyone who knows and loves you... We, we have no memory of you. He goes through an arc, and it's nice he isn't just here because he's a face you recognize. Also, Peter using math to figure this world out is both clever and surprisingly believable. I'm actually amazed at how smart this solution is. The mirror dimension is just geometry? You're great at geometry. You square the radius. Divide by pi. See, so in the likely circumstance you're trapped in between worlds and fighting a magical realm wizard, geometry was finally essential to learn in school. He traps Strange in his own world, maybe for a little too long? What's the amount of time he was there? I've been dangling over the Grand Canyon for 12 I know, hours. I know, I know. Don't you have lunch with the Midnight Gospel? And Peter decides to do his best to rehabilitate the villains. Look, our technology is advanced. I can help I you. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. I said it. Do you think that's your catchphrase? Why do you think that's your catchphrase? I really shouldn't be too picky seeing how so much of this movie works better than I would have thought possible. With that said, man, this is a lame way to ride out a character. Where's Connors? He told me he wants to stay in the truck. Okay. No cure for him then. Peter's mouth wasn't even moving when he said that line. Where's Connors? 
Let's go eat, huh? <laughs> but it's cool. Then randomly cut back to a truck shaking to show, oh yeah, we didn't have to edit that in at the last minute. That was always in the script. Maybe they just got tired of looking at his teenage mutant Audrey Two face. When I get out of this, we're gonna rip you and you while Peter seems to legit help them out as he reprograms Doc Ock's chip, gives Electro a stabilizer, and even Norman helps out. When all this is over, if you need a job and you're willing to commute to another universe... And I have to say, all these actors are bringing their A-game. Mm -hmm. Not one of them feels like they're half-assing it. With that said, though, the Goblin does take Norman over and convinces everyone pretty quickly that evil is cool and good is dumb. These are not curses. They're gifts. Gods don't have to choose. Most of them I can buy except for Sandman. His turn makes no sense. What the hell does he have to be evil about? All he's done is help out and what, we're supposed to think he's like, ha oh, ha, off to save my daughter, which I may or may not have already done. What's he doing? Hey, run, please. He tries to stop them, but gets killed by the goblin. I have to admit, I like that she dies doing something noble and isn't just a bystander. And with great power, there must also come great responsibility. So on top of the scene playing out really well, despite her saying what you've heard a million times, despite her clearly replacing Uncle Ben, despite you could argue Tony was the Uncle Ben role in this universe, they changed with the lore in a way that's backwards, but does ultimately add up. One of my pet peeves with the other Holland films is that there was no sense of purpose. I didn't want to see Uncle Ben die again, but if you show me those two movies without me having any knowledge of Spider-Man said this is one of the greatest heroes ever, I wouldn't know what you were talking about. It'd just be a kid trying to be a hero done well, but done in a million other stories. But whether intentionally or unintentionally, they made Parker someone who just wanted to do good and over time gain that purpose, gain that sacrifice. It's also done after we've gotten two movies to really know him and his friends, so it feels a lot more personal. I just wish we could see Peter. Speaking of which, Ned tries to help by using one of Doctor Strange's rings, resulting in... <sighs> Kick Oni! A lot of people say this film was redemption for Andrew Garfield, but you're wrong, Garfield was always great. Tobey Maguire arrives, and now all cinematic Spider-Mans are in this movie, and while to many this wasn't that big a surprise, I think everyone was impressed with just how much of them were in this movie. I was assuming they'd be in the climax, or maybe a little cameo at the end where they help out, but they are here for most of the third act, and they do everything you want to see these three do. Except one thing. No, they did that behind the scenes, this movie's great! I've been trying to find your friend ever since I got here. I just have this sense that he needs my help. Our help. Uh, if anything, your franchises need his help. Yep. This movie is smart to let the friends meet up and cry about losing Aunt May. Most movies would rush into getting all the Spider-Mans together, but a scene like this shows they do care about the characters first. And when they do meet up, this whole scene feels like a love letter to all the themes and ideas that have carried through Spider-Man. My Uncle Ben was killed. It was my fault. <laughs> Uncle Ben like the rice? We do that here. It is pretty funny when Peter asks if uh, they're... That would have been a total dick move if they did that. Oh man, I'm glad they didn't. Versions of Uncle Ben said with great power comes great responsibility. Garfield almost has to think, is that what that overwritten line was trying to say? She told me that with great power comes great responsibility. What? How do you know that? If you could do good things for other people, you had a moral obligation to do those things. Not choice, responsibility. Uncle Ben said it. Sounds like your version was a little tighter, could fit on a t-shirt, but same idea. They science up and figure out ways to zap the villains back to normal and tell them to meet at the statue of Captain America. All the villains show up and while they all still have great chemistry, this is surprisingly kind of a lame climax. Of course it's awesome to see the three Spider-Man swinging around, but it's a pretty ugly looking finale. It's murky, it's dark, it looks like they smeared a fart on the lens somehow. Even the statue has a look like X-Men did it, and even then it was pretty meh. They do get the villains back to normal though, leading to this obvious but still kind of funny line. I just thought you was going to be black. Oh man, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't apologize. There's got to be a black Spider-Man somewhere at the end. Well, and like a black property, the white property is constantly taking ideas from it. 
If you're like me, you thought this death of girlfriend moment was going to be some into darkness bullshit, but somehow it went from worst scene to best scene in a millisecond. Are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay? Hell with tick tick boom, that one face should have gotten him an Oscar. It's time to take on the goblin, though, as, again to the film's credit, it remembers this is Holland's movie and it gives him an arc of being pushed to the edge trying to get revenge. <laughs> So while there's things animation can do that live action can't, there are things live action can do that animation can't. This is an example. This image has to be Tom Holland, Willem Dafoe, and Tobey Maguire. It's only powerful because it's these actors right there with years of history behind them. There's not even a line here because it's not needed. It's all in their looks. I'm not saying animation or live action is better, they're just different, and a good art form should lean into what makes it different. <laughs> Goblin is turned back to normal, but Strange says the multiverse is out of control and he has to make the world forget who Spider-Man is to send it back to normal. I'm just waiting. <laughs> Wait, you tell me you see me again? <laughs> I usually hate these setups because it feels regressive and like things aren't moving forward, but seeing how the series is already backwards and they turned it into something great, I am curious what they're gonna do with it. We haven't had Peter all on his own in the series yet with no friends or expensive gadgets. That was a pretty big part of the comics for a while, and I wouldn't mind seeing how they handle it. Also, again, the acting is really stellar and everything builds up to this choice of him leaving the ones he loves so that they can have normal lives. Rent is due on the first of the month. Don't be late. You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door! Oh, next one, next one. Oh, I'm not kidding. As the after credit sequence shows what I thought would be a big upset with Tom Hardy as Venom getting zapped back to his reality. I thought people were gonna freak because they were really building this up in the last Venom movie, but maybe folks realize we really didn't want to see these particular movies together. Sir, you have to pay the bill. Hey, at least I- Honestly, I was kind of bummed out. Like, I really wanted to see Tom Hardy's Venom interact with Spider-Man, at least for like one second, ten seconds. But just to have him be there, just hang out at a bar all day, how, however long he was, and then just as he's about to go and meet the Avengers, Spider-Man, whatever, then all of a sudden, like, oh, he's got to go back to his universe, and like that, that, that always bummed me out. Uh, I kind of wish we could have got them interact some way somehow. Oh, uh. I technically, make this a Sinister Six movie. <laughs> Now that was, in my opinion, the best live-action Spider-Man movie. It's like it took all the little problems that added up in the other films and almost completely fixed them. Okay, it's not 100% the comic, but it not only somehow made the other films more like the comics, but it got the soul and character down in an almost totally backwards way. Getting us to relate to these people for two movies, playing the long game, and having us warm up to them really leaned hard into the whole friendly neighborhood Spider-Man feel. I really love watching Tom Holland grow up as Peter. Yes, he was like 20 when these started, but it's actually kind of eerie how much he's looking like Parker growing up. Much like Spider-Verse, this isn't how I would imagine the best Spider-Man movie, but that's also what I really like about it. It is different, while also paying homage to everything we love about this series. Where Spider-Verse did everything that could be done with that idea in animation, No Way Home did everything that it could with this idea in live action. At least in a way that, for the most part, balanced out. I really don't think it would have worked if these guys were brought into. Both this and Spider-Verse are movies that on paper shouldn't work, but because of great skill, clever thinking, and a clear love and understanding of the material, they show their strengths and both their similarities and their differences. <gasps> of course, pushing really hard, that's a Tor's weakness! Honestly, I totally forgot about these guys. <laughs> Okay, Critic, we're gonna- It's all good. I do a review, now everything is fine. Oh. Yeah. It, is that how things work around here? Pretty, Pretty much, much, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, I've learned that you really can't- We know. Oh. But I think I've learned that you can never- We know. Oh. 
I guess you can show yourself out then. Got it. Hey, say, how is Gilbert Godfrey here? In our universe, he's working on a new version of the aristocrats joke with Bob Saget and Norm MacDonald to make some good people laugh. The same. Hmm, good to know. Nah, he did. I'm the nostalgia critic, I remember. So, did you just hire us because you saw us in a parallel universe? No, I made you in a lab. Oh, good. Wait, huh? Wait. Exactly what? I hate the woods. <laughs> exactly, I would have been the same way too. Hey everybody, this cameo for- I would have been like, hold up, what? Huh? Excuse me? <laughs> Yeah, that was Nostalgia Critic's review of Spider-Man No Way Home. I mean, to each his own. I mean, you can't you can't you can't expect something that everybody loves to be loved by everyone, you know. But honestly, yeah, I love this movie. And I think he is right, you know. It is the greatest live action Spider-Man movie ever. Compared to the other ones we've gotten, yeah. And, uh, well, that's it. Bye.